G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today I am continuing this little redraft series I'm doing. I did this last year before the draft, I'm going to continue this year. So yesterday I did the 2023 redraft and I found it very hard to move players around because we just didn't have enough data. Uh, in 2022 I actually did this at the end of 23 after one year and I found that for a variety of reasons it was easier to mix things up a little bit. So we're going to revisit 2022. Now we have two seasons of information about these draftees rather than just one and naturally the order has changed up a fair bit. So let's explain the premise of this and some ground rules so it's really clear what I'm trying to do with this redraft. It is not just a ranking of the players from 1 to 20. I'm going to redraft the top 20 of that year's draft if the clubs knew what information they know now. Which means that certain draft principles and ways of valuing players remain the same. So if you're a really highly talented midfielder or a key position player, you're probably going to have some bias towards those types rather than, say, a really gun small four. That's usually how drafts go. So that will apply here. And the interesting characteristic of this year's draft is that we just had a lot of evenly rated mids outside the top handful. It was about five to seven midfielders where even at the time of the draft, you think, oh, clubs could go one way or another. And it's really unclear who those players are. Now, in some cases, those players have performed really well. Some have struggled to get a game at all. You know, one or two of them have had outstanding games in short bursts and then been injured, so it's really hard to separate. But nonetheless, we have more information than we did when I did this video 12 months ago. So we're gonna crack in, we're gonna redraft it from the GWS Giants with pick one all the way to 20, which was also the GWS Footy Club. And before we get into it, if you would consider subscribing to this channel, if you're getting something out of the content, you wanna see plenty of draft content up until the day. I'm trying to get to 33,000 subscribers by draft day. I don't know if I'll get there, but if you get something from these videos, I would appreciate it if you did so. So let's crack in, none of this waffling around. So GWS, took uh, Aaron Cabin with pick one. Now, I think that the, the two best players of this year's draft would also be the two best performed and that they're also probably going to be pick one and two in this scenario. It doesn't always work like that. However, in this case, I'm choosing between Will Ashcroft and Harry Sheasel. Now, 12 months ago, I went Harry Sheasel. I'm probably just going to flip it the other way. I think it's a line ball decision, but I'm going to give Will Ashcroft pick one this time. So the Brisbane Lions match with pick one. Now, you would be very happy with either of Harry Sheasel or Will Ashcroft in this scenario. I just want to make it clear that team needs are not going to be relevant to this particular exercise. So there still will be bias towards you know certain positions like a roll goal midfielder like a Will Ashcroft. That will still apply here, but I'm going to assume that GWS aren't necessarily on the lookout for a key forward. I'm going to assume that every team has the same draft needs. So with that being said, Will Ashcroft, the recent Norm Smith medalist, I think he's earned pick one for the time being. But Harry Shears was right up there with him as an absolute star and moved into the midfield this year and I think will be an absolute A-plus player for the duration of his career. North got a beauty here. Well, actually, it's GWS in this scenario. Now, that puts North on the clock with two selections where they went Wardlaw and Sheasel with those two picks. I'm still going to go Wardlaw. I haven't seen enough for any of the group of midfielders underneath to overlap him at all. I think he is the clear number one primary midfielder outside of Will Ashcroft, of course. And North will be very happy to take him once again to join the blue and white. So then they've got their next selection here. And again, this is not a needs pick, but I think Aaron Cadman does deserve to go in the top handful of selections. Here he goes at pick four to North Melbourne. He had a great year this year, 30 goals. You know, as a key position player, doesn't wasn't expected to be putting out that sort of output. I think he's had a really good start to his career. And again, a little bit of a bias towards a key forward. If you can get a key forward who is a bit of a proven quantity there in Aaron Cadman, I think that's where he goes. Now, this is where it opens right up. There's a lot of evenly rated talents. And uh, again, this is a tough one. I think I'm going to go with a balance of performance and upside here and go Josh Weddle for Essendon here. They originally took Elijah Sardis. And I'm going to take Josh Weddle, who was named at center half back in the 22 under 22. And great athlete, great upside as well. And I don't think he's necessarily a true key position player, but he, I think he's got that running capacity and the athleticism to play higher up the ground too. So I think in a fairly even draft pool, I think Josh Weddle shines as the next best. Then we've got the Gold Coast Suns. And again, I probably will go a little bit more upside than strictly just performance here. But Bailey Humphrey has done a lot right at AFL level. And I think he has the talent projection that will appeal to clubs, well, Gold Coast in this scenario, retaking their same player. It'll appeal to them how much he can project to be an absolute A grader if he fulfills his potential. And he has played a fair bit at AFL level so far in his two years with the Gold Coast Suns. So I'm pretty comfortable saying the Gold Coast just retake the same player. So now we're right in the weeds of like the midfielders that are all evenly rated. And I think I'm going to take Full Hawthorne, who originally took Cam McKenzie here. I'm going to go Mateus Philippou. Now he did 
lose his spot in the in the AFL team, I think halfway through this year, and he came back and just looked like a different player. And he looks like he's ready to spend more substantial minutes in the midfield this year as that 191 centimeter athletic, agile, penetrating midfielder who can play forward as well. I think in terms of upside and performance towards the end of the year, again, it's an even pool of midfielders here. I think Philippou probably presents as the most enticing prospect if you're picking first in this scenario. So Hawthorne get Mateus Philippou. Got a couple of father-sons here in a row, and I'm going to go Max Michelani next uh, with Geelong bidding on him. Adelaide will secure him at pick eight. Now, Michelani is a very well-performed player from this year's draft and an absolute jet. I have no complaints about that. However, why is he not going higher? Again, I'll just speak to the positional bias I have of a third tall sort of running defender, probably just not getting into the top five of this year's draft. I think even if he's better performed than Philippou at AFL level, you still go for the midfielder forward who has the potential to change games, even if Michael Anney hasn't really put a foot wrong at AFL level yet. So unless Michael Anney can be a midfielder, then, then he'd probably be right in the top handful of these selections. But I think there's so much upside there. He's still going to go in the top eight selections, which is great going for a running defender. He's an absolute jet, but again, bias towards certain positions. Then the other father son I'm going to go with is Jasper Fletcher, who again is a premiership player. Now, I found him a little tough to categorize because as far as pedigree goes and, and resume, like he's done it all really. He's already a premiership player and he's been best 22 in a very good team virtually his entire career so far. He is substantially less important to the Brisbane Lions than Will Ashcroft, so I don't I don't elevate him too high. But when you're comparing him against some of the other midfielders we're about to talk about, I think he's Jeff definitely done enough to move up the rankings and be picked ahead of some of these other types, whilst not quite having the upside, in my opinion, of a Mateus Philippou. Now we have the Geelong Footy Club who have Jai Clark, and it's hard to judge Jai Clark because he hasn't played as much footy as a lot of these other prospects, nor has Elijah Sardis, who are still available in this scenario here. I'm going to get them to take West Coast Ruben Jinby here. Now Jinby's latest evolution is he looks like he's going to be more of a running halfback or a combo of being an accountable defender and an athletic running defender at the moment, but I do think over time he will progress into the midfield. Towards the back end of 2024, he put in some really strong form as that accountable defender, and I think while I said there is a positional bias, there is still some doubt on these other midfielders. So again, I think as you get further from the top, you can probably go the safe bet defender. I think Ruben Jinby is a safe bet defender. I don't think he's going to be a world-class midfielder, but he might be the best available here in my personal opinion. He's played every game he's been available for. So now West Coast are on the clock and at this selection, they originally took Ruben Jinby, who is not available anymore. I'm going to take the other boy that was drafted to West Coast in Elijah Hewitt. Now, this one might be controversial. I realize that. I realize that is probably going to be the first one that cops a negative comment, uh, but that's fine. Let me know what you think. It is an even pool of midfielders here, and Hewitt was taken below Cam McKenzie, I think Oliver Hollands from memory, certainly Jai Clark, and certainly Elijah Sardis. He also didn't play this year through injury. So when I did this video 12 months ago, I had Elijah, uh, Elijah Hewitt at peak six. I can't do that anymore. When you have a year off with injury, you naturally drop down the rankings. However... However, while he might not have played that many games, I still think he's played more than Sardis and Clark. But he did do a lot in those 16 games to really win me over as being a really high potential talent. Now on talent, I do think he probably goes before Ruben Jinby. However, again, you gotta factor in the fact that he missed a year with injury. Preseason just started, he's fully fit, and uh, things are looking good for Elijah. So I'll back him in this as a talent and upside selection. Bear in mind though, he has played still more games than some of the other guys below him. Then I've got Cam McKenzie, the next selection. Now Cam McKenzie has played a fair bit more footy than Elijah Hewitt, but again, I'm sorry, I'm just going to make a talent assessment here. I think Hewitt's upside is significantly higher. I do think Cam McKenzie is a good midfield prospect, don't get me wrong, and that's why he's still going at pick 12 to St Kilda in this scenario. But again, gonna go the upside there. There is some risk with Elijah, but there's, that's a talent assessment in my opinion. Cam McKenzie hasn't done a whole lot wrong. He's not necessarily a important part of Hawthorne's team, but he is a very young player at the same time. He's played 34 games of AFL football. He just slides down the rankings very slightly on the actual order. Then we got Carlton taking the original pick in Oliver Hollands. Oliver Hollands looks like a decent type, good two-way runner, um, kept his spot in a good team. He's contributed. His brother is there now. Elijah had a great season. Uh, that is Hollands, not Hewitt. I just don't think the upside is there compared to, say, a Hewitt or a Philippou in particular. And Cam McKenzie probably has has the same amount of runs on the board, really. And he was taken higher on the actual draft. So that one's hard to separate, but he more or less holds his position. It's dropped a, a few spots because we got some more father sons in there. At pick 14, the Western Bulldogs originally took Jed Buzzlinger. And look, again, it's tough to rate Buzzlinger because he hasn't played a game yet. And that shouldn't be the expectation on him anyway, because he's a tall defender who needs time to develop. However, I will throw some love here to Darcy Jones, who got drafted to the GWS Giants, did an ACL in his first season. And this year, while he might not you know, jump off 
off the stat sheet, I think some of the exciting highlights he produced and performing well in a good team really elevates his ranking. So he moves up six spots. The Bulldogs pull the trigger on him. Again, we're assuming the Bulldogs don't have a need for a key position defender, which they presumably did at the time of this draft. West Coast pick next, and uh, there's a couple of the midfielders taken around this range still available. Uh, both Jai Clark and Elijah Sardis are available here, and instead of Elijah here with the original pick, he's now gone to them, uh, they'll take Jai Clark here. So again, hard to separate Clark and Sardis, who is the next selection, so we'll collectively talk about them. Melbourne take Elijah Sardis here, who was originally taken at pick five to Essendon. Now, these boys have just got on the park a little bit less than everyone else for different reasons. Clark projects to be this consistent, reliable, inside midfielder that I really liked at the time of the draft. It's just, there's not a lot of data to suggest he would be going higher than some of the midfielders I've got ahead of him here. Sardis, by contrast, probably a little bit more upside. Uh, however, he seems to have a little bit of a flaw in his kicking and hasn't really broken into that Essendon midfield yet. So again, even talent pool, I think he was picked earlier because of his upside and he was a very well-performed junior. But we're a couple of years removed from that now. So we're splitting hairs, but I think Sardis slides down the order a bit. It feels like it's a massive slide. It's just a reflection of how many evenly rated midfielders as they were that year. We have four selections left and I've got some key position players in here. I want to sh show some love to Jed Buzzlinger. I think that he has had done nothing wrong in his career so far. This is only a, sl a slide of about three spots to the Sydney Swans, originally taken by the Western Bulldogs. So as far as I understand it, he's been playing well in the, in the VFL and just hasn't cracked a game in an experienced Bulldogs team that has had more experienced defenders ahead of him. I still think there's nothing to suggest he won't be a good player, but I certainly wouldn't move him up the ranking, so he just shuffles down a little bit. Now we've got a bolter at the next selection. We've got Collingwood here. I'm gonna say Josh Draper. You could make the argument he could go ahead of Buzzlinger, but I'll just hold based on pre-draft expectations too, because Draper was a Cat B rookie to Fremantle in 2022, and he was named in the 22 under 22 team this year. Well, that's a lot of 22s. But 197 centimeter athletic defender, um, you know, again, I think you should show a little bit of a bias to key position players when they have shown so much at such a young age, and Draper definitely has that. So you could go Buzzlinger, you could go Draper here. I've got it in this order personally. Oh, you thought I was done with West Coast bias. Haha, <laughs> you're wrong. Sydney have the next selection here, and I'm gonna take a guy who wasn't drafted in this draft at all, but instead he was taken at pick one the following mid-season draft in Ryan Marrick, which means he was eligible for this draft. And I think he would certainly get drafted again, and I think he's done enough to show he would go in the top 20. Again, you look at his stats, you're not gonna get what I'm saying here with Ryan Marrick, but a very talented 196 centimeter key forward who has been thrown into multiple positions and he's got the skills to play back. Again, I think you show a bias to tall talent. I think he is a absolute Monty to be a good AFL player. Can't move him up too far. He's not that well performed, but I have no doubt he would be taken in the top 20 of this year's draft if it was redrafted. And then finally, a bit of a softball, GWS taking Ed Allen. Now, Ed Allen has only played a couple of games, but from what I understand, has performed pretty well in the VFL. And this is tough because there will be some players that I'm aware played well in the VFL, like Ed Allen, like Jed Buzzlinger. And I can't possibly know that about every other prospect in this year's draft. So let me know if you disagree with these rankings, of course. But Ed Allen did crack a debut for a Collingwood side. I think he played two games for a team that, you know, is in contention, or at least, you know, certainly thought they were for the most part of this year. I know they didn't make finals in the end, but he will more or less hold his draft position here. I don't see any reason to have other players ahead of him. To talk about some other players that could have gone, you know, in this sort of range as well, I did consider Noah Long, who I slipped into the top 20 last time I did this video, but he barely got on the park this year through injury, so he slips out as a smaller player. Harvey Gallagher played every game this year, I think, or close to for the Giants, and he is another contender to shoot into this top 20. But being a smaller player, again, I will bias against smaller players unless you're Nick Watson or similar level talent of really getting drafted too high. So I'll say that Gallagher's around the mix, but not quite. Harry Rouston, again, I think he's played about seven games for the Giants um, in his career so far. Again, just slips away, just hasn't had the same amount of runs on the board as other types and was drafted after guys like Sardis and Clark anyway. Matthew Jefferson, another a key forward prospect at the Melbourne Footy Club who hasn't cracked a game and I'm just not aware of what's happened since. So I'd imagine he still goes around this range. I think in my first draft, I did have him in the top 20, but he slips behind a few other key position players that have a few runs on the board. So there you have it, guys. Let me know in the comments what you hated about that. We're obviously not gonna all agree on that, um, but I've done my absolute best. So let me know what you think of this video and let me know if you want me to do 2021 next because I'm excited for that. That should be an interesting draft. For now, I'll thank you for watching. I thank you for being subscribed. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.